thanks for being here. It's a strange time to be giving a lecture the day before the national election. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have to think about that for the next hour. We can uh, think about other things. So uh, as you can see from the first slide, I'm going to um, talk about the idea of the global suburb, uh, which is a very important idea for architects and designers and urban planners. Uh, and I'm going to sort of um, start out and talk a bit about the kind of conceptual basis for the book. Um, but it's not, it's not extremely theoretical, but I want to bring in kind of a number of ideas that uh, represent what my thinking was, why I wrote this book. Um, and I will tell you that, um, that the idea for this book really was uh, uh, several experiences that I had. First of all, I was a visiting professor actually in Mexico uh, at the uh, Tech de Monterrey in the, in the campus of a city called Querétaro, Mexico. And uh, while I was there, I actually stayed, a friend of mine was an architect and he had designed a house on the outskirts of Querétaro, which was basically kind of a global suburb. And I'll talk about what that means. And uh, subsequently I traveled throughout Latin America. I was in Argentina and Chile and then Brazil. And I began to notice this phenomenon of a new kind of peripheral development. Uh, and I looked around and I realized no one was really writing about this phenomenon. Um, people have written much important, many important things about the uh, outskirts of uh, cities in Latin America and about the, the problem of poor people living there. But all of a sudden what's happened is that uh, those communities are being encroached upon by a different type of urban development. And that's really the subject of my book. So let me uh, move forward here and talk a little bit about why I, uh, I'm writing about this thing I'm calling a global suburb and something called global sprawl, which is basically the name that we give to the sort of land use pattern implied by this new type of development. So uh, as it says on the slide here, um, so what's happening around the world is that large cities, all cities really uh, across the planet are growing and there's no more room in the older neighborhoods near the center. So of course they're expanding toward the periphery. Uh, and, but governments have had to rethink uh, the use of land outside these core urbanized regions. And so this, what I noticed was, and if you note, there's a, um, an asterisk on the right hand of the slide. I'm not talking about the, the phenomenon of squatter urbanization, which has been very well written about and is extremely important, the plight of poor people who live in these very precarious settlements. I am gonna come back to that subject uh, when, we talk, when I talk about some of my case study work, but I'm not specifically writing about that phenomenon. It is being written about, it has been written about, and it's extremely important. But I also was interested in this, this uh, sort of parallel phenomenon, which is the gradual urbanization of um, the periphery of all over the world, but especially in Latin America, that subject of my, my work. Um, and so the form, the, the slide that you see here is, is an aerial photograph of an American suburb, which as you can see, has a very low density, curvilinear, classic um, American suburban land use pattern. That is not necessarily the form that the global suburbs I'm talking about take in other parts of the world. They're much higher density, high rise kind of um, global suburbanization, but they have something that's very important. And that's what they've copied from the American suburb, and I, it's on the slide here, I call it the cultural narrative of the American suburb. And it's a set of ideas and values that are inherent and embedded in the kind of architectural and urban design model of the American suburb that was exported to other parts of the world. And that's really the subject of my talk today. I wanna to talk both about the form of these new developments, the values embedded in those developments, the implications of those developments, and specifically, the problems, uh, especially ecological problems related to this phenomenon that's occurring around the world. So when I talk about a socio-cultural narrative um, based on the American suburb, which was developed in the 1960s in the United States and has grown over the last 50 years to dominate our metropolitan regions. Um, so I, I'm saying the physical form of are our suburbs, which are very low density, single family houses spread out in a particular pattern is not necessarily being entirely 
exported to other parts of the world. But what is being copied is the values embedded in our suburbs. And that is social exclusivity, private space over public space, this sort of fear of crime and what uh, author Mike Davis calls social policing uh, in these urban, these suburban neighborhoods, a tendency toward homogenization of built environments, the sort of cookie cutter residential subdivisions and shopping malls that we see in the United States are being replicated again in slightly different forms. They're high rise or medium rise, and sometimes also low rise at higher densities as we'll see in the case of Mexico. Um, and then a lot of emphasis on consumerism, uh, kind of artificial landscapes, as you can see these, these shopping malls, which uh, started in the United States, but are now um, um, everywhere on the planet in these global suburbs. So um, how did this happen? And, and sort of what's the kind of backdrop of why the, uh, these global suburbs are so important to study? So I wanna talk about uh, very briefly about the idea of modernity, which is something I'm sure as students of architecture, students of urbanism, you're quite familiar with. The second half of the 20th century, uh, the notion of uh, modernity in architecture was fundamental. And one of the pieces of that story was the modernity of the suburb. The suburb was seen as a giant social solution for post-World War II, particularly uh, veterans of the war in the United States who came back from the war and we created a housing agency and a funding mechanism that was able to finance at very low cost um, the purchase of homes on the periphery of American cities. Um, and that's what I call the larger project of American modernity. That modernity was very attractive to the rest of the world because it, the United States had just you know, won the war in a sense. And we, our values were about democracy and leading the world uh, to create a new and better, presumably better economy uh, and a certain type of consumerism and community building, which was building these American suburbs, okay? And so there were a lot of people who have written about modernity and what it meant, even criticizing it. Marshall Berman wrote a book called All That Is Solid It Melts Into Air. And he is critical of, of, of modernity, but he also realizes that it's something that we will have to embrace. And he says any attempt by modern, it's an attempt by modern men and women to become subjects as well as objects of modernization, get a grip on the modern world and make themselves at home in it. So this sort of idea that it was inevitable that America would be defined by its modernity, right? So um, what happens is that that project, that what, I, what we might call the modernity project and others have written about this. So I don't wanna steal that, that phrase, the modernity project, but the modernity project was very attractive to other countries because it um, evoked a certain lifestyle of the American suburb, the single family home, being able to shop at a local shopping center, kind of living near the countryside, uh, having access to these new technologies that came along in the 1960s and 1970s, really the 50s, super highways, cars, um, and staying in motels, which was a new thing back then, these car oriented, places that you could stay in that were very accessible all of a sudden. So this is something that became very attractive to the rest of the world. So this modernity project is important because of what it symbolizes. So those single family houses, it wasn't just about the built environment, which is what we're interested in as architects and urban planners and urban design scholars, but it was symbolic of other things like the image of freedom and democracy and security and prosperity. And that's why it appealed to many other parts of the world. Not necessarily that single family house itself, although obviously that was an ideal that was very attractive to the idea of that kind of uh, freedom from more crowded conditions, uh, being close to the countryside, that was certainly part of it. But it was also the symbolism of being uh, a part of this movement that was occurring post-World War II in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So that's the sort of backdrop for the evolution of American suburbs. And then the way in which by the end of the 20th century, the American suburban idea is being copied in other parts of the world, not necessarily in the exact same physical form. It tends to be more of a high rise, higher density urbanization, but the values of our suburbs are showing up 
in other parts of the world. So it's not a surprise that this sort of dream suburban house, this kind of, you could call it a design paradigm, was exported to other countries because of what I just said, because it symbolized freedom and democracy and economic prosperity and technology and all the things that um, other countries that were modernizing at the same time aspired to. So the global suburb took a slightly different form, but it's really taken off all over the world. Um, and it has different names. So, uh, throughout South America, um, for example, it's called different things in different countries. Um, so barrios privados in Argentina, uh, they're called um, condominios fechados in Brazil, security villages in South Africa. Um, uh, they, they have their own Americanized names in certain parts of the world, like a suburb outside of Cairo, Egypt called Beverly Hills, or uh, another enclave called Orange County outside of Beijing, China. So they look at the United States, they look at the idealized iconic suburbs of North America, and they take the, literally take the names and rebuild their own versions um, and call them things that evoke those uh, places in the United States that they aspire to perhaps copy. This is a uh, urban layout of the Beverly Hills development outside of Cairo, Egypt, and a McMansion in, on the outskirts of Beijing in a community called, referred to as Orange County. A little bit of irony there since the name of the place is actually a political jurisdiction rather than uh, a, a city or a community, county. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, the globalization, not only of the cultural narrative, but the physical and environmental implications of building suburbs in uh, outside of cities in the United States and then in other parts of the world. So not only are other countries copying our cultural narrative, they're also copying our ecological problems. Uh, so our suburbs, which were built in the 1950s and 1960s, were built as automobile oriented, very low density, single family on the outskirts. Uh, and they have a very important quality or a very important element. And that is what we refer to as single use zoning. So we, one of the pillars of modernity in the urban planning world is the idea of separated land uses. That has turned out to be a huge environmental ecological mistake. Okay, the idea that you, that you create separate zoning of different land use types, like residential land uses in one place, commercial land uses somewhere else, work land uses, uh, office land uses in, in another location, that implies that every time you have to go to one of those places, and if they're very, very spread out in low density, super decentralized uh, suburban areas, it means you have to travel across space and it's highly inefficient because they're so spread out that you end up having to use this machine called an automobile, which uses a lot of energy and is um, extremely expensive and causes all sorts of problems. So this, um, this, this land use plan or this um, urban design paradigm of the American suburb was problematic from the very beginning. But at the time it was created, it was seen as a uh, wonderful uh, symbol of modernity and ac having access to nature, having access to the countryside, having being able to get out of the crowded city. Unfortunately, as, as some scholars have pointed out, um, when we built the suburbs, we actually took out all the things that we were celebrating. Like we create communities, we call it quail gardens, but we kill all the quails to build it. Or we call it um, uh, pine hills, but there's no more pine trees because they get bulldoze to build the, suburb, the suburban communities. So in fact, many of the reasons for building suburbs were destroyed by the very uh, urbanization uh, approach that was used in those locations. And I'll get back to that uh, in a little bit. So um, sprawl, I keep using that term, so I just wanna be clear what I mean by urban sprawl. And this is, you know, many scholars have written about urban sprawl. Um, it's defined as low density, very spread out, or deconcentrated over formal rural or peripheral areas. And the pattern of overall settlement 
is irregular, discontinuous, and dispersed with either multiple centers or no centers. Uh, and it's defined, as I mentioned before, by separation and distance between commercial, residential, and other land uses. So that is the very definition of sprawl. Now, why is sprawl a problem for what I would call sustainable urbanism, which is why is it, why, why is that not a design that's really gonna work moving forward in the future? And I'm sure a lot of you have taken many classes, so probably I'm repeating some things that you already know, but I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, if you're gonna create sort of more ecological spaces or ecological urban designs, you need a center, you need centrality. Centrality implies less energy consumed, people closer together, you can, you, you can walk or travel by bicycle. So there are so many environmental and ecological advantages to living closer to a center, to having a center to go to. And there've been a lot of books written about the importance of centrality. Uh, Richard Register's Eco Cities is an excellent book on that subject. Um, the second problem, as I mentioned before, is that if you have highly dispersed settlement pattern that's also irregular, how do you build a transit line that can get to the people that need to move around the city? If people are moving in all different directions in a very chaotic way, it's gonna be hard to, uh, to, to create a settlement transit approach that is efficient. And so the result is that it encourages people to use automobiles. That's essentially how we get around in the 21st century in most um, metropolitan regions. Uh, and it encourages individual versus collective travel. And if we're all moving around, uh, we're using a lot more energy and it's just not as efficient. And the separation of land uses, uh, it also increases the number of daily urban trips because not only do you have to go from home to work, but from home to shopping, from home to socializing, from home to taking your child to the soccer game or wherever else, uh, whatever other social errands you do during the day. Um, and finally, uh, many scholars talk about the fact that this kind of, um, you know, 1950s and 60s suburban paradigm of individual houses kind of separates people and it gets them thinking separately rather than collectively. And we're certainly at a moment in history when it would really be great if we could think collectively, think about our common public interests in making the world a better place. There are actually some very specific ecological problems related with suburbs and urban sprawl. They've been written about by many scholars and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I did wanna mention several of them because they're important to this conversation. Um, there are four that I'll talk about here, air pollution, traffic, um, the problem of lack of exercise and the larger problem of the decline of social capital. So um, suburbs imply having to get to somewhere far away and so you need a form of transit, usually some very fast travel, like freeways, we call them freeways, super highways, if you will. And um, studies have shown that people who live near those types of um, transit lines tend to suffer higher levels of um, lung damage from the pollution that's created there. So that's a problem. Um, also, when you're traveling faster and getting off a freeway and traveling through the, the suburban neighborhoods, the, literally the road designs cause accidents. And there have been studies of um, traffic accident patterns finding higher accidents rates in suburban communities because of the frustrations of traffic, moving at faster speeds on freeways, the way the roads are designed when people get off a freeway and they're driving fast down a, along a, a let's say, a strip highway with a lot of commercial uses, with a lot of um, entrances and exits that are sometimes not visible. And uh, it's, a, it's a setup, design setup for, for, for more um, traffic accidents. The third one is um, perhaps less well known, but there have been some really important studies done in the early 2000s. Uh, one, uh, some of the most well known was a, a comprehensive study of 83 metropolitan areas in the United States, looking at um, rates of obesity and where people live and finding that uh, people who live in uh, suburban areas who, who walk, who hardly ever walk and drive everywhere are suffering uh, higher levels of obesity, higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, heart, heart attacks, and other problems. So 
Um, there's a lot of work, ongoing work in the public health field on this subject. So it's important to know that this is an issue as well. And then the last one um, is symbolized by Robert Putnam's uh, great book in 2000, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Communities, where um, he talks about the, um, the loss of what scholars refer to as social capital. So when, uh, not, not, I don't wanna sort of romanticize traditional urban communities, but there is something that happens when you live in an, in an older neighborhood where you walk or you interact with people on the street, there's this bumping into people, this accidental or um, spontaneous uh, thing that happens in cities. Um, and that's where people make contacts and network. And now everything has to be done digitally. It's kind of a different world. So there seems to be this idea that the social capital of having connections and meeting people through friends in your neighborhood, the people you get into touch with, uh, is being lost. And, and Putnam's book talks about the uh, not only the loss of connections through the serendipity of bumping into people in older or, or walkable communities, let's say, but also the, lo the loss of institutions related to people socializing, that people are so individualized now that they're not joining clubs, they're not participating in these activities as much. So there's a, another problem that, um, that I'm interested in. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this either, but there are these more subtle kind of somewhat conceptual problems related to living in the suburbs. And I'll just mention a couple of ideas. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this and I'm not gonna develop the science behind some of these ideas. But um, you know, I think it's safe to say that um, you know, cyberspace, and the world that we live in now where we're you know, on our smartphones all the time does kind of disconnect us from the environment and from our, the places that we live in. There's, a lot, there's been a lot, a lot written about by psychologists and other observers about the, the increasing distancing and people being numb to their surroundings and not kind of plugged in to, to the world that they're part of. Now we are the exception because we're architects and urban designers and urban planners. And we obviously are very interested in connecting with space and with buildings and so forth. But think about the average citizen and how much these technologies maybe contribute to people kind of losing touch with their surroundings and with their uh, environmental consciousness. Um, and the fact that we're on, in cars all the time, you know, driving in a private machine that's moving really fast and we're busy trying to get where we're going. So how much time do we have to really connect with our community, with people in our community and with the world around us, the city, our neighborhood, buildings, history, architecture, the environment, uh, this um, living in uh, autopia as uh, uh, it was referred to um, a long time ago in a book uh, on the social, on the four ecologies of Los Angeles by Rainer Bannum, where he talked about the idea of autopia. He celebrated the freeway culture of Los Angeles, but that was in the 1960s. A lot has changed since then. Um, and there's another one that I don't wanna spend a lot of time talking about, but this sort of global corporate uh, homogenization of the built environment, you know, these, um, all the, the degree to which our uh, built environment is increasingly corporatized. And even the fact that there's a lot more places for people to shop and a lot more space for shopping now, 1985 square feet per person, 2005, 20 square feet per person. So people are spending a lot more time in consumerized spaces that are bigger and bigger and more less maybe connected to the, to the world of walkable communities and of interacting within the urban environment. Uh, and this plays out globally as well, the growth of these you know, giant global uh, enterprises uh, that have their own implications across the planet. Um, and this leads to kind of a, uh, I would call place destruction. There's a great book by George Ritzer called the McDonaldization of society and how you know we're building things that look the same. We're losing our sense of place in many cases. And again, I'm preaching to the choir on this one because that's why we're all here today. We're all studying and teaching and learning, reading, and doing research on architecture and urbanism. So we believe in place identity, but it is being destroyed by some of these trends. And just to mention one that I mentioned in my book, Global Suburbs, uh, the original building of American suburbs were giant companies like the Levitt Corporation, which came up with a very monotonized, very um, 
uniform assembly line approach to building housing. And it was based on a, a, a guy called Taylor who came up with this efficiency model for producing things in factories. And the Levitz took that idea and applied it to this assembly line uh, cookie cutter approach to building these packaged um, suburbs, which were, I remember as a child, I grew up in the suburbs of New York and, you know, look at these photographs. I used to be able to climb a tree. My parents rented a house and from that tree, I could see Levittown and it looked like this way up high. It just was this kind of cookie cutter world. So I was probably like six or seven years old. And I think I, um, I must have in my back of my mind been shocked by that and thought, Man, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, so, and again, the loss of community um, and, you know, the loss of community and the, the idea that, um, that we are public in our behaviors. Uh, Richard Sennett, the sociologist, wrote this book back in 1974 called The Fall of Public Man. And he talked about the shift at the end of the 19th century from the emphasis on, on the civic world to the emphasis on private, the private world and how this has increased in the 20th century uh, with the building of suburbs. And again, more and more people uh, he calls it the retreat into personal and family space and almost like the fear of public space. Uh, I remember quoted in the book, the stranger is a threatening figure. Few people take great pleasure in the world of strangers, the cosmopolitan city. So um, whether or not you fully agree with that idea, I think it's something to consider. So let me get into some um, case studies. Uh, I know I don't want to... Um, I want to leave time for questions and discussion here. I know I'm covering a lot of ground. Some of it's fairly general, some of it's very specific. So again, my, my reason for writing this book was that I saw this phenomenon of um, building of mi middle class, working class, middle class, and elite suburbs in the periphery of cities in Latin America. And um, I thought it was problematic for two reasons. First of all, because it was actually pushing out poor people who were living in um, you know, lower income settlements that have their own names around the world. They're called colonias in Mexico. Uh, they, they're called pueblos jovenes in Peru. They're called uh, favelas in Brazil. And people are struggling to hold on to their land. And now they're put in a situation where they're being outbid by global corporate interests who suddenly see the periphery as a place that they could develop for other clients, wealthier clients, that that land is profitable. Why should we let the poor live there? So that's a problem. And the second problem is what they're building is ecologically, environmentally not sustainable. And it's copying, in my view, the worst um, ideas of American urbanism. We have lots of good things that we've done in this country. I'm not sure suburban development is one of them. And so it's problematic to me that that is the thing that's being copied. Um, if not literally, then the values, as I mentioned before. So let me just talk a little bit briefly about the two cases that I, that I looked at in my book. And you know, uh, Global Suburbs is, is in paperback. You're certainly encouraged to try to buy it. I think it's available as an ebook as well. Um, so this is uh, in Mexico. In in the 1990s, the government decided that it was going to try to uh, jumpstart kind of building its own suburbs. And they came up with a plan sponsored by one of the housing agencies called Infonavit, uh, which is a national housing agency that normally builds housing for people who are uh, of less, of more limited means, but who have some affiliation with the government. So they built these massive middle class and working class suburbs outside of major cities. Uh, and they look something like this. I think this one's on the outskirts of Guadalajara. Sort of a very cookie cutter approach, a little bit higher density than the United States, but the idea was people could own their own homes and in near, near the countryside. But one of the problems, and I think it's partially represented in this photograph, is that they didn't really think about the quality of place and where would people actually go if they didn't have to travel by car or by a bus. And would there even be buses serving these communities? So in many cases, these new suburbs that were built outside of Guadalajara, Mexico City, Tijuana, and other cities were very placeless. Um, they were isolated. They never connected them to commerce or schools or where people worked. 
And not everyone who bought these houses owned a car. So after a, about 10 years, a very frightening pattern began to emerge. And that pattern was that nearly 30% of all these homes that were built are being abandoned. Um, something like when I wrote the book in uh, 2015, it was about a half a million. I think it's gone up since then, probably closer to three quarters, if not a million um, of these units are abandoned because they're isolated. There's no shopping, there's no transit. They're very far from the cities. Um, and, and in effect, this program is a massive failure. Uh, a friend of mine from Tijuana, a woman who's a filmmaker, uh, produced a great film about the suburbs of Tijuana. Um, and um, it basically showed these children growing up in these suburbs, their parents are working in the maquila, which is the industrial plant, assembly plant, and they're gone during the day. And the kids have nowhere to go. They're isolated. These kids are like 12, 13, 14, 15. They end up getting in trouble. Um, they have nowhere to play. There are no, not even any really playgrounds near where these communities are. It's a very sad movie, but it's really well done. It's, a, it's quite a um, shocking, I think, portrayal of what it's like to live in these suburbs um, in, in Mexico. So this is really a crisis for Mexico because um, it's a country that like much of Latin America has experienced tremendous globalization. It, it signed the free trade agreement in 1992. It's concerned with issues of human rights and housing, but building, pro and by the way, most of these suburbs were turned over. The government um, created a mechanism where um, people could get mortgages. They nationalized the kind of mortgage friendly system to allow people to buy houses but they turned over the, the land to private companies. And a lot of those companies were making huge, you know, tens of millions of dollars in profit, uh, selling these bad houses to people who ended up being stuck with these mortgages and houses that they couldn't actually live in. Uh, so this is a huge problem for Mexico. And it's uh, basically admitted in the early 2000s that that program had been a failure. Um, but I think behind this problem of uh, why that program failed is the question of access to housing for people in general. And this is where I want to come back to the question of people who are of lower income means. There's this kind of uncertainty about land. Who owns it? Like if you buy land or if you live on a parcel of land in many places in Latin America, you don't necessarily have title to the land. This is a huge problem in Mexico. So a lot of people who live in colonias have been sold a house by someone who didn't actually own the land or have been told that they would be, they would be given access to the, the land. Uh, often the land is, um, is in uh, the form of what was called an ejido, which were rural communal farms outside of cities created after the Mexican revolution. And as cities urbanized out into those rural areas, those lands were owned by these ejidos, which somehow were transforming into selling their land to people, but those sales and those um, legal transformations didn't always work. So there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not you own your land. And this plays into the hands of global corporate interests because knowing that people aren't sure whether they own the land, they can come in and try to take it with uh, very little uh, you know, fight from, the, from the, the people who are living there because their status is uncertain to begin with. So when I looked at Tijuana, which is on the border with San Diego, where I live, um, the, the difference between Tijuana's suburbs and San Diego's suburbs is really shocking. A lot of people in Tijuana who are the poor, very poor live in these kind of um, squatter suburbs that are um, you know, made out of makeshift uh, wooden uh, type construction. Traditionally, that's where people were living. And in the United States, of course, there's a very, very different uh, type of suburb. So uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, Tijuana started to grow toward its periphery. Um, it grew in population from 165,000 to over 2 million by 2010. So that's a huge demand for space outside the city. And what happened was the poor, the urban poor <clears throat> were forced to move away from the center and this map shows the original squatter settlements 
uh, in pink and the yellow is where it started to grow in the 90s and beyond. So you can see what's happening is the city is urbanizing toward the periphery. And the areas that don't have color on them are because Tijuana is a very topographically um, complicated city. It has a lot of mountains that come right into the city and hills that are not buildable or canyons that are not really buildable. And you can see that people who live in these colonias often lack basic infrastructure like sewage, running water, and used to be even electricity. That's gotten a little bit better. On the San Diego side of the border, you can see that a lot of development is occurring uh, up against the border with Tijuana. So there's a lot, lot of land increasing in value on the San Diego side, doing economic development projects and community planning projects. And so Tijuana also started to develop its, its uh, its side of the border here. And I'm only showing that because I want to look at a case study and ask, we always have to ask the question, who does the city belong to? Who has a say? And this is a community that I want to just briefly mention called Maclavio Rojas. Um, on the outskirts, the eastern side of Tijuana, it's a community, uh, here's the location of it. And you can see it's in an area that is a lot of residential, but also in industries moving out in this direction as well. This is the highway to Tecate. So it's kind of an important um, connection between Te Tijuana, Tecate and Mexicali. So there's a lot of commerce and trucks moving between the assembly plants in Tecate uh, into Tijuana and across the border into the United States. So this corridor is an important development corridor and it's become very valuable. And that's Maclavio Rojas was built in the 1980s on land purchased from an ejido, legitimate legally, presumably, by migrants who came to the city from other parts of Mexico and wanted to build their own community. So they did. They took this parcel of land that was, this is the, the community here, uh, and they built their own houses. They subdivided it. They built their own schools. They created their own water infrastructure. And um, this slide said it had over 2,000 families and 10,000 inhabitants. I think now today it has like 15,000 people living there. But the land was really valuable because it was on the path of development. And because there was a growing demand for this kind of corporate suburbs, a lot of these companies tried to buy up land around Maclavio Rojas or declare the community illegal and take away their water rights and not allow them to have a legitimate school. And so there's a lot of politics involved in the um, conflicts between older neighborhoods and these corporate suburbs that want to come in and build here. So, uh, like I said, it's on prime real estate. It's in the past of industrial development. It's attractive for these new suburban housing. There's also some a, a Toyota plant and a Hyundai plant nearby. So there's a lot of co contradictions uh, between the community and global investors. And the result is that um, this community has fought back. Uh, a uh, an American filmmaker came to Tijuana in 2005 and uh, created a, a great movie called Everyone There their grain of sand, um, which won a lot of awards and basically told the story of this community. Meanwhile, a lot of their leaders were jailed because they tried to get their water system legalized and the, the uh, corporate people didn't want that. So uh, there were you know, strikes and protests. Uh, and this is an ongoing problem that has yet to be completely resolved. Um, I'm going to switch gears now and talk finally about Brazil before I go to questions and answers. Um, so Brazil is a slightly different case. There's a lot more um, high rise in the global suburbs of Brazil. Um, probably the most well-known example and the first example uh, is Brazil's largest metropolis, Sao Paulo, which has this kind of high rise elite suburban high rise urbanism. So actually, I think I took this photograph from uh, a building that I visited when I was doing my research. Um, this is a uh, very wealthy family. They, they own the entire floor in one of these buildings, similar to the ones you see in the, outside the building. Every room in their, in their um, house had a, a terrace. Um, and the elevator that went to their house, to their apartment, they owned the entire floor and only they could get off of that floor. They had a special key or code to get in. And this is what you're looking at. I believe this is called Murumbi. Uh, this um, elite suburb, high rise, uh, what we might call a vertical suburb in Brazil. So um, Teresa Caldera wrote a book called uh, City of Walls and talked about how in Brazil, 
people believe that they're more secure if they're higher up off the street. So there's a real, all of the suburbs that are built in most Brazilian cities tend to look like this. They're very high density um, and people feel safer being further uh, from the street, which is sort of sad. Um, as architects, you may also note that the colors, the buildings have different colors. And that's one of the only ways they can create a bit of identity in their building approach is to use different colors on the exteriors of the buildings. So the garden suburb in Brazil really goes all the way back to the 1960s and 70s uh, when architects were inspired by the building of the new capital in Brasilia to create these standalone kind of using a European concept of a garden suburb uh, where they had built these super quadras or super blocks and began to experiment with building these uh, global suburbs, global garden suburbs outside of um, outside of Sao Paulo, for example. So one of the things that Teresa Caldera mentions a lot in her book is this obsession with security. And I already mentioned the idea. So what you see with these high rise buildings is they hire private security to guard the buildings. They put you know, uh, fences around them and um, it's very, very um, security conscious. Um, this is a typical sign you see that telling you that it's monitored by uh, security cameras and the images are transmitted. And it, you know, it's like you're being watched by you know, Big Brother uh, as you're walking around these neighborhoods. Um, and it's very privatized. There's hardly any public space. There are very few parks. And even when you're on the street, you almost feel like people are watching you. So it doesn't feel environmentally friendly. It doesn't feel social, socially engaging. Um, and even the idea of security, it's not a public security system with police. Everything is privatized. Um, so I just want to uh, make a quick stop here to clarify that in Brazil, the word suburb, suburbio, has a slightly different meaning. Those are old neighborhoods in peripheral areas, but they're not favelas, they're other kind of lower income neighborhoods. So the suburb in Brazil is actually called a, um, a closed condominium or a condominio fechado. It's different from the, the word that we think of in the United States, which actually comes from the Latin suburbium, which were the original suburbs of Rome. And I mentioned that in my book as well. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about Rio de Janeiro um, and um, um, its urbanization pattern. So if you look at this aerial photograph, the purple areas are the urbanized areas and the green is where you can't build. So it's, Rio is a fascinating metropolis because it is covered in mountains and dense jungle. Uh, what they call the Atlantic rainforest comes right into the city, the Mata Atlantica. So it started in downtown and it grew to the north. You can see there was a lot of land here. And as they ran out of land, and as people realized as, as, as Rio grew in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, uh, people began to look toward the coast because this was a very industrialized area. So the waterfront here wasn't very attractive for um, recreational uses. So they began to look south. And once they were able to build tunnels through the mountains here, they were able to have access to all of this land here. So this is where all the coastal development and neighborhoods from the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s and on. So you have Copacabana, Ipanema, Leblon. And the area that I studied, the new suburb, which is the global suburb of Rio de Janeiro is here and it's called Baja da Tijuca. Uh, and it was a plan created by Lucio Costa, the urban planner for Brasilia. So let me say a little bit about Baja da Tijuca. Because it's the first, probably the first major uh, global suburb of um, Rio de Janeiro. Um, it's, and you can say here again, you can see a little bit more of a, a simplified image of how mountainous Rio is. So obviously once it began to urbanize on the north side, the only other option was to start building neighborhoods down toward the south, the south zone. So you have two zones in, in Rio, you have the Zona Norte and the Zona Sul. And this is where all these new beach communities, and then all the way out here, you get to build tunnels, massive tunnels through these mountains to get to this global suburb here, the new suburb of Rio. So there's a lot of demand for coastal property and they hired the planner from Brasilia, Lucio Costa. And Lucio Costa had a very idealized image of what he could do there. He wanted to create an egalitarian city 
that was uh, the most beautiful oceanic city in the, in the, in the world, he called it. Amaish bela cidade oceanica do mundo. Not necessarily, it wasn't really connected to the rest of Rio because of all the mountains. And it was kind of an enclave. So by its very nature, it was going to become a suburban enclave. And although I don't mention it in this slide, I do mention in my book that ultimately what happened was he created this, this plan that was supposed to be egalitarian and everyone would have access to it. But the land was bought up by private real estate companies and the value went up and it only became affordable to very wealthy people. So Baja de Tijuca, which has about a quarter of a million people, is a very, very wealthy suburban enclave. There is no poor people. Anyone who's lower, uh, who has lower income status there has basically been pushed out. And I actually have done walking tours and seen neighborhoods and canyons and things where people have basically been forced to leave. Um, this is what it looks like from the air. <clears throat> and this is one of the other problems of Baja de Tijuca is that ecologically, it's a very fragile, um, it's called a double lagoon barrier. So you can see there's one land and there's, there's, there's a second piece of land and more lagoons. So there's two sets of lagoons and they're fed by natural movements of tides. And the moment you start urbanizing this and interrupting tidal flows um, and then introducing pollution into the water here, it causes all sorts of ecological problems. So there's a lot of problems with sewage, contamination, a lot of problems with air pollution. Um, so it's a, it's a very kind of looks a little bit like Miami Beach, uh, but it's all very suburban. It's all automobile oriented. It has more shopping malls uh, than you could imagine. There are probably a hundred shopping malls in just this one area of, of, of Rio. So um, it's very much a single use zoning. You have the residential areas, then you have commercial areas in certain sub parts of the, of the region. It's not walkable, really. People use cars to go everywhere. Most of the buildings have parking lots underneath or around them. They're all cut off from each other. So you can't even interact between one neighborhood and another. Um, and as you move further down the coast, it becomes more spread out and even less walkable. Some of the older areas at the origins that are not in this photograph do have some walkability. There's almost no public space. People mostly meet in shopping malls. And a lot of the shopping malls are quite exaggerated and almost theme park-like. Um, and this is what's lacking in Baja de Tijuca. This is a street corner that is very much celebrated in older neighborhoods in Rio because it has this um, thing on the corner that's called a bochequim, a neighborhood bar, that's very street friendly. It's open air, it's got tables, people can meet each other. Um, and this is something that doesn't exist in Baja de Tijuca. It wasn't designed to be a walkable urban space. And a lot of what's being built has no identity. There's not even a name for these places. They're all kind of part of this giant spread out set of neighborhoods that are really defined by the name of the condominium and no other real neighborhood identity. So people talk about the Miami effect because a lot of Brazilians, a lot of people from Rio, when they used to want to go shopping, the nearest place in the United States was Miami. So they would fly to Miami and get out and they would go to shopping malls and buy up all the products that they wanted to bring back, clothing and, and uh, household goods and so forth. And uh, so when they started to build these uh, suburban global suburbs, they literally not only um, copied the idea of the mall, they literally brought in US companies. So you see a lot of hard rock cafes. In fact, a lot of the shopping malls have American names, like the, the, the name of the shopping mall will be like downtown or uh, some other uh, very American using English. This one is called, ironically, is an Italian word, Cita America. So um, go figure that one out. This is called Baja World Shopping. That's the name of the shopping center. And it has all this sort of Disneyland like fake. It's supposed to be like the international shopping mall. You can be in Paris or you can be in the Middle East. And um, it's all very fake and um, kind of a sad place, actually, not doing very well. In in the, uh, in my, my friends tell me that this is one of the malls that just doesn't work. People don't really feel very excited being there. Um, so let me 
come to a conclusion and then add a few final comments, if I could, um, about the global suburb and what it means for us, for architects and urban designers in the 21st century who are concerned about a sustainable model for urbanism. First of all, um, there's a political power struggle going on in the periphery. I made reference to that in the case of Mexico and also in the case of um, Brazil where um, the planner designed this community to be accessible for everyone, but then the politics were, it was bought up by wealthy investors and it no longer was accessible to all Brazilians. So in Mexico, the government uh, went into a partnership with private, private housing. They built the millions of suburban homes that have basically been abandoned. And meanwhile, migrants still have shaky control over their land. And in Brazil, they created these global suburbs that really kind of repeated that cultural narrative of the American suburb. So I want to end just by throwing out, these are not new ideas, but I just want to say that, you know, when we think about what we can do differently, I think we have to think of urban living in four scales, regions, cities, neighborhoods, and individuals. So we have to change our values. We have to get uh, people to think about urban living in a different way. So it's not only us designers and planners and architects uh, that can change the world, but also people have to, we have to convince people that the world could be different. And one of those is this concept of the bioregion, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So, you know, we have to think about how we live and how it impacts the environment. And also there's a lot of work being done about um, the relationship between food, agriculture and the city. So what about um, thinking more about using land for growing food, cutting down on shipping costs and getting people to eat uh, things that are grown more closer to home. Um, the second thing is creating cities that are literally slower, like the slow food movement, the slow city movement, Sita Slow, really talks about you know, the idea of, of not only local food, but also walking, cycling, preserving history, calming traffic, restoring ecology, restoring community. So again, these are Big, big things, but I just want to throw them out there. And neighborhoods themselves have to become more empowered. Um, people have to have ownership of their space so that they can think about what they want for what's best for their communities. And uh, fine. And also things can be done, pop-up spaces, this thing called tactical urbanism, I think is really important. Finding ways for people to interact in public spaces um, and have more of a, a, a walkable city. Whether it's micro interventions like these little urban parklets uh, or um, even you know, taking a famous public space and making it more accessible to people. So what's going on in Times Square in New York City is a good example of that. Um, and my, my last story is about something that happened in Brazil that I think is very encouraging, which is that everyone knows about Carnival that happens every spring or in February. Um, this kind of celebration uh, with the samba parades. But there's also, um, they used to have these things called these block um, celebrations and they disappeared in the 1950s and 1960s. And everything was about the commercialization of the carnival season through the samba parades where they built stadiums for them. But people in neighborhoods wanted to bring back their local community um, block parties are called blocos in Portuguese. So the Bloco has made a resurgence in the last 20 or 30 years, and now it's become a thing again. And it doesn't cost anything. Everyone participates. It's really a celebration of community. And I'm really impressed in Rio at the, um, the way in which Blocos, they, they, they use technology. They have, you know, they have um, websites during the carnival season, and they can tell you exactly how many people to expect, and where it is, how to get there, all sorts of information. And people just show up and starts out with a small band playing music and then they walk through the streets and it grows and grows and grows until it comes to a final location. In this case, it's one of the well-known blocos in a community in Rio called Santa Teresa. And it ends at this um, Largo or Plaza where people just listen to music and, and drink and have fun and celebrate their community, even from other communities who come in to these celebrations. So to me, this is um, emblematic of people desperately wanting sense of community, wanting to take back their neighborhoods, wanting to live in places that are more sustainable and more community oriented. Um, and the last thing is that we as individuals maybe have to overcome our own 
egocentrism and become more ecocentrist. We need to think about how we can slow people down, how we can um, become more uh, connected to our, uh, to our neighborhoods, whether it's through green spaces or um, different things that people can do to connect to their city. So thank you very much. I think that's my last slide. I've uh, taken a little more than an hour. Sorry about that. Um, but I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, I don't know how we're going to do this, but uh, I'm sure someone will let me know.